charts, uh, she sent the charts a card thanking everyone here for all the prayers for her grandson that, you know, went through the surgery and all the difficulties and, and just wanted to thank each and, every one, uh, each and every one of you for praying for her. Uh, is there any other request, Brother Randall? Yes, I'm sure it is. It's very difficult. Me and Brother Darrell was just talking about similar things today. And yes, we ask that you pray for them. Anyone else? If not, I'll ask Brother Randall to word our opening prayer or, or our prayer before we change order of service, and then we'll stand and sing number 581. Our Lord and our God, we come before thy throne. And we're unworthy to call upon thy name were it not for the righteousness that thou hast clothed us with, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Lord, we sometimes grow cold. We often grow cold in this world. We don't have the love for one another that we ought to have. We don't have the love for thee that we ought to have. And we pray that thou would ignite a fire within us, Lord. Take the spirit that thou hast placed within us and stir us up. Stir us up by the preaching of thy gospel. Stir us up, Lord, by thy spirit that thou might have people to call upon thy name in this world. That is our desire and that is our prayer at this time. We know that of ourselves we can do nothing. The Lord told us that when he was here on this earth. He said, without me you can do nothing. And we truly know and feel that in our hearts. But in our flesh, Lord, we sometimes think that we're self-sufficient. That we can do whatever we need to do and take care of ourselves and take care of our troubles on our own and we go that way Lord we go our own way and we're able to see when we look back that we needed thee and that thou was with us all the way helping us and protecting us from our very selves protecting us from the others in this world that seek to do us harm protecting us from the fiery darts of the wicked thou has been with us through the days of our lives and helped us when we did not deserve it and thou hast loved us and clothed us with righteousness and picked us up and set our feet upon a rock and established our goings. And we have so much to praise thy name for. We have so much to be thankful for. We're not thankful enough, Lord. Help us to be thankful. Help us to be gracious and kind one to another and patient with each other as thou hast been with us. Lord, we thank thee for thy son, for loving us, for sending him to this earth to redeem us for his interceding work on our behalf even now Lord in heaven that he's able to say I died for that one I died for that one and intercede on our behalf Lord that thou would even hear this prayer that thou would grant us blessings from heaven Lord the very favors that thou hast sent our way through him please help us to be thankful for these things please forgive our coldness and our apathy forgive our nation for clinging to the things of this world for looking for entertainments and things to please our flesh instead of looking unto thee and looking unto righteousness. Forgive our covetousness. Forgive our idolatry. Help our nation, Lord. Forgive our fornication. Cause this man that should stand before us to preach thy gospel that we might be stirred up now. Help our minds and hearts to receive it, to study out thy word, Lord, in our homes and our families to be thankful for thy blessings each and every day. Forgive us. In Jesus' name, and hear this prayer in his name. Amen.
very thankful for the prayer that was offered by Brother Randall on our behalf and would ask that you would continue to pray for me and for each other and for the furtherance of God's kingdom. I have a lot of thoughts on my mind. Some things that I will speak about are things that I've spoke about in the past, but I want to begin with the text, and then I want to, in the Old Testament, begin to reflect back in the New Testament to some things that I believe are happening. And I believe this message, whether it's liked or not liked, it's it's so needed among God's people, and it needs to be understood. In Psalms 42, in verse 5, David asked a question. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? David is a man of like passions, just like you and I. When you begin to read through the Old and New Testaments, you find that many of God's people at given times in their life went through what you would call spiritual depression. Some people don't like the word depression. Some people believe that it's a word that you shouldn't speak, that you should put off, but the Bible speaks of it. It really does. And it speaks of the answers to what ails us. Therefore, there's nothing more important for God's children than to understand this. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. A number of times I have tried to preach on happiness. I believe happiness is vital to a, a, a vibrant church, to a zealous church, to a people of God in a nation. And had I not went twice to the Philippines, as most of you know I did, and had I not have been around numerous brethren from, from town to town and island to island, I might have I had a different view of this, a different understanding. You know, I, the one thing, I may never go again, I, I don't know that, if it be God's will, maybe so. But if it's not the Lord's will, and I don't, I don't go again, the one thing that I will never forget is how happy those people were. And by our standards, by our way of thinking in the United States of America and in the Western culture, they should be the miserable people, and we should be the happiest of all. But I don't find it that way. I find it just vice versa. You know, they, don't have, they live in a third world country. They don't have the delicacies we have. They don't have the comforts of life that we have. Yet there is a, an excitement, a zeal, and a happiness that money can't buy, that things can't buy. But by the standards of our, our carnal thinking, with all these comforts and all these delicacies, they ought to be miserable and unhappy and rejected and downtrodden and in, 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 in despair. And yet... I find those things more common in this country. I'm reading a book that, if any's interested, it's by Elder Michael Goins. It's his latest book called Let Not Your Heart Be Troubled. Most of you know and uh, some of the things that Brother Michael's went through, but he's, he's just like many of you and I, of us. He's like many of the patriots, patriarchs, so I, I should say, in the Bible. We find that the troubles that, we, that exist today in our lives, the unhappiness that exists today is nothing new. It began early in the Bible. We find illustrations in the Old Testament and the New Testament alike. Think about Elijah, and we're not going to look at many illustrations today, but Elijah had went up against the, the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel. Then Jezebel said she was going to kill him. Well, he went and sat down under a juniper tree. And you know what his request to God was? Lord, I, I want to die. This man was in serious spiritual depression. And this is real problems that real people, even God's people, have in their lives. But there are real answers for these problems. In this world that you and I live in, those folks that are unhappy, sometimes they've been unhappy and in a state of spiritual depression so long, they don't know any better. It's been a way of life that they don't seem to be able to overcome, to get out of. We're going to close with the verse later on. In John chapter 5, when Jesus talked to this man that went to the pool at Bethesda, 
when the angel of the Lord came down and stirred the waters, someone would get in the water and they'd be healed of their infirmity. This man had an infirmity for 38 years. That's a long time, isn't it? This man had been into this condition. If you read that, you're going to find out that it's likely that man didn't think anything was ever going to change. But Jesus said, Wilt thou be made whole? In other words, he says, Do you want to get well? That's a big question. Some people don't want to get well. They've lived in the condition, uh, in this depressive state and unhappy state so long, they don't want to get well. Jesus said, Will thou be made whole? Now, happiness is something that is tremendous in our lives. It gives you an energy that you can get nowhere else. It gives you a desire and a zeal that you can't find anywhere else. In the church, with your family, with your neighbors. We're going to look at a word in Psalms 42 that says countenance. That means your face. That means your expression and your impressions. Your countenance. The Bible talks in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 6 when the Lord went to Cain of a falling countenance. I think so much about the expressions we have upon our face. In Michael's book, he said, Isn't it interesting that Jesus didn't say, Let not your life be troubled. Think about that a minute. Let not your life be troubled. No, Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. I'm here to tell you, when the troubles of life resonate into your heart, when they find a resting place in your heart and your soul, You've got real trouble. You've got troubles that are hard to get beyond and to overcome. But it is my desire and my belief, according to the Word of God, what the Bible says, that we can be extremely happy. There is a way. And and David here, we're going to look at what he faced and how he dealt with it in Psalms 42. When we get back to there in just a little bit. I don't believe Jesus ever intended for you and I to be sad and unhappy. There's another book, if you're interested in reading books, by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. He was a Protestant preacher, in, a Welsh Protestant preacher in England. He's got a whole book on spiritual depression. The one thing he said in his book that, that really got my attention was, he says, what kind of impression as God's children or Christians do we leave upon others? I mean... Are we walking around with a sad look? And I know that I'm guilty of that sometimes, and and it's something that I need to work on. But I'm going to tell you right now, we can all put on a mask. We can all put on a mask. Outwardly, we can show something, but I'm interested in getting to the root of the problem because real joy can't be hid. You remember when you was kids and you grew up in school and they sang this little old song, If You're Happy and You Know It, Clap Your Hands? And the third, third, third verse went something like this. If you're happy and you know it, your face will surely show it. You know, that is about as true a saying as you'll come across. In Brother Michael's book, he made a statement that that just won't go away. And I'll tell you, you can deny, you can tell people you're happy, you can get caught up in all the things. See, in, in the United States, I believe in this country, we're looking for everything we can, from the bottle to drugs to sex to alcohol to, to buying things to even our work. We're, we're, we're looking for relief from unhappy times. But happy is that people whose God is the Lord, one for, for Psalms 144 and 15. We're looking for it. And we can be. But we we got to begin to understand what makes us happy. Michael made a statement. He says, what the heart feels, the face will reveal. You know, the face can reveal anger. The Bible speaks of the face shining, which is is joy and rejoicing. It speaks of boldness. But you know, when we fall into a state of tremendous sorrow and and, and, and depression, the face will show that also. The countenance. Now, I believe God intended for you to be happy. In John chapter 10, spend just a little time over there before we get back to the Psalms. In John chapter 10 and verse 10, in the second half of that verse, Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. 
And I'm going to tell you the context of that verse, the prior verse and the one following it, is not really in the eternal context. When we go to heaven, we're going to have more than any abundant life that you and I can even comprehend or imagine. That's not what he's talking about. It's not what he's talking about. Do you feel like you're living an abundant life? What makes your life happy? What makes it abundant? Is it the things that we can do in this life? Is it your job? Is it your children? What, what is it? I mean, it, the list goes on and on. There are blessings that we have, but what really brings happiness and peace into your soul? That's what we're going to get at here in a little bit. You know, we can whitewash it. We can be superficial. We can put on a mask. We can pretend once a week when we show up around each other to be happy, but are we really happy? People that know you and see you on a, a daily basis, they know. You can put on a show, but I tell you, the feelings that you feel in your heart, your face will reveal them. Some people are better at acting happy when they might not be. And there are people who are truly happy, who re truly rejoice day in and day out in the Lord Jesus Christ. They live their lives for that. But the troubles and the afflictions of life have come. He said, let not your heart be troubled. But then Jesus said in John 16 and 33, in this world, you're going to have plenty of trouble, every one of them. The writer of Job said, man that is born of a woman in Job 14 and 1 is of a few days and full of trouble. We might as well come to understand that just a few days after being born into this life, trouble is going to be with us till we close our eyes in death and go home to be with the Lord. Jesus said, let not your heart, let not your troubles get on top of you. When your troubles get on top of you, they begin to resonate into the heart and soul. I believe that's exactly what Jesus was talking about here. He said, the thief cometh not, but for three reasons. And I tell you, that thief being Satan himself, if he accomplishes the first two, the third one will fall right into place. The third one will fall right into place. The thief cometh not but to steal. What is it he can steal? He can steal your inner peace. He can steal your rest in the Lord. What is it that he can kill? He can't steal your eternal life. He can't kill your, uh, your eternal life. He can't kill the, the soul. Only the Lord Jesus Christ has that power. He can steal your peace and he can kill your joy. And I'll tell you, You'll live a life like someone whose life is destroyed. You will. You may exist, but you very well may have no life in you. We got numbers of people walking around. You know, I don't believe there's a one of us here in this congregation that have not went through some degree of spiritual depression. I know that I have. I know that almost 19 years ago, I, I spent a year or two in this condition. We're going to find that David was deeply in this condition. Thanks be to God, I, I, I was delivered from that. But you know, there are folks who sink deeper and deeper into it to the point that they're like the man who had the, the infirmity for 38 years. They've lived that way so long, uh, they, they don't even realize how they're living and what's going on in their life. But I tell you, what the heart feels, the face will reveal. It will show, and people that know you will know. You know, putting on happiness is one thing, and, and we ought to be positive. But I tell you, it's not hard to be positive when you're happy. You desire to be among the Lord's people. You have a zeal to be in the church, to be with your family. You, you have a zeal and, and an energy at work that you don't have. When you're unhappy, you become tired and wore out. The troubles of life bog down. You don't want to do anything. There's a vast difference in... in in the health of our spiritual health and even our physical health. Now, there is such a thing as, as clinical depression. There is. You know, there are things that have been proven by medical science. The physiological differences of the body and, and, and different things can cause that, and there, there are therapies and, and some medication to treat that, but many of the causes and symptoms of spiritual depression are like clinical depression. Notice what Jesus said in John chapter, I mean, in, in the ninth verse of John chapter 10. There's a theme here in these first 9, 10, and 11. I am the door. I am the door. 
By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. That man will have a peace and a rest in his soul, but you can only find in Jesus Christ. You won't find it in the things this world has to offer. You won't find it in your job that you're tied to. You won't find it in your family. You'll find it in the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, in, in the 10th verse, I am come. Do you remember what the Lord told Moses at the burning bush? I am that I am. I am the door. I am come. I am the good shepherd in verse 11. There's a pattern there, is there not? The I am is the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember how mad it made the Pharisees when he told them, I am that I am? I am the Alpha and the Omega. I'm from the beginning. I'm everlasting. I am. We have a hard time understanding where real peace and real happiness comes from. Jesus said back in John 16 and 33, he said, These things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. A person who is cast down has an unhappy soul and a troubled soul, and that's what David had. And I bring this to your attention because as you study God's words, you find this to be very common among God's people throughout the ages. And I desire not to put a Band-Aid on a big wound, but to get to the root of the problem where you and I can live the most rejoiceful and happy life that we could possibly live. But aside from focusing on Jesus Christ, I believe it's impossible. I am the door. I am come. It's all about him. It is the thief. You know, when you get down to one of the, I believe, the greatest cause of spiritual depression is unbelief in Satan. That thief is Satan. He can steal your peace. He can kill your joy. And I tell you, you won't have much of a reason to want to live. You'll be like Elijah. Why am I here? Why am I living? He tells us in John 15, These things have I spoken to you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. I know for a fact, according to the reading of God's word, that he intended for you and I to be the happiest people. When we go out into the world, do we walk around like we're trodden down, overran, in a state, desperate state of life? Do people say, I want to be like him. That he has something. I don't know what it is. He gets through life with a smile. He's happy. Whatever he's got, I want some of it. That's how it ought to be. And that's how we ought to be as Christians. Or do we live in such a state, in an unhappy state, in a laborious condition, scorning delights and all the things of life, and others look at folks who are out, yelling at ball games or whatever it is and seem to be excited. What, what, how do we represent ourselves as children of God? The Lord Jesus Christ told Peter, says, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against me. You know that's an offensive position? It wasn't a defensive position. Happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Not anything else in that world, in this world, but God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. I am the door. I am the peace that you're searching for in your soul. It's me. It's in me. It's every day in me. It's not in your job. It's not in your entertainment. It's not in your family. It's in Jesus Christ. And it's something that I need to work on as much or more than anyone here. Because life is short. It is. And we ought to be the happiest people. We've been blessed to know we're going to live in paradise forever. Jesus knew we'd have troubles. He knew we'd have problems, and he intended for us to be happy. Now let's go to Psalms and, and notice what happened to David in Psalms 42. When I remember these things, uh, let me get on verse 5. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? First of all, I I say a few words about the Psalms. Psalms are revelations of God's truth through human experience. Did you know that? 
Psalms. Sometimes people split them up into five books. The five books of Psalms. They were the prayer and praise books of Israel. But they've been carried down through the times. And therefore Christians in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. These Psalms are tremendous. They're revealed truth. They are revealed truth. Through the emotions, the desires, and the sufferings of the people of God. By the circumstances through which they passed. These are people who wrote about things they were going through shortly after or even in the midst of these trials. When you read Psalms 51 and the mourning that David done over his own sin, that was real. It was a real man, a real experience. And this is too. David had come to a place where he had no happiness in his soul. His soul was terribly troubled. He was talking to himself. He's asking himself a question. This is a key to turning your life around. David faced the problems. I didn't say he liked them, but he faced. He says, why art thou cast down, O my soul? Do you know cast down means to sink, but you know that the word cast is a shepherd's term? When a sheep would go out to a soft piece of ground and lay down, inadvertently that sheep would roll over on its back and its legs would stick straight up in the air. And did you know that sheep could not recover itself if the shepherd didn't come? The sheep would die. Did you know that? He couldn't turn back over on his legs. David's in a state here that he's saying, I cannot in and of myself recover from the condition I'm in. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why do we ever get cast down? And he goes on to say, And why art thou disquieted in me? I no longer have no peace and rest in my soul. Something had happened to David. He'd come to the end of his way, had he not? I know every one of us had probably been there at some point in our life. He begins to tell us about these troubles. We've, we've sang this song in verse 1. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. What is the picture that David gives us there? Of a small deer running from a predator. This is how David felt. This takes place, this psalm, somewhere during the ten years that he was on the run from King Saul. He admired Saul. He dwelled in the king's castle. He was best friends with Saul's son, Jonathan. Their, their souls were knit together. I, it's just an amazing story. We're told in 1 Samuel 18 and verse 1, And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. David says here, I no longer have any peace. Inward peace and solace in my soul. The Psalms are about folks that have went through experiences just like you and I have. Elijah went through them, Paul went through them, and we could go to one experience after the other. But what we want to look is at how David faced these and how he dealt with them. One thing that was going on with David, he was being chased like a fugitive for a crime that he did not commit. It's interesting to know that David was a man after God's own heart. Think about that for a moment. A man after God's own heart. The only man in the Bible that that says anything about. And yet he says, I'm, I'm in a state that I almost want to die. I, I've had it. I've had it. You know, life is like a pressure cooker, is it not? I know people don't use them as much. When I was a kid, uh, my mother used to cook with a pressure cooker all the time and had a release, release valve on top. It did. And when the pressure got too high, it began to whistle and release that steam. You know, if there wasn't a relief valve on that pressure cooker, it would have finally exploded under that heat. Life's kind of like that. Life's kind of like that. Unless we get a handle on the dynamics of the things that caused our minds to get in this state, emotional state, then we'll, we'll, we'll end up in this place where David was, ready to explode. David had had it. He, he, he was all but ready to give up. 
He goes on and says, My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear for God? I tell you, I believe David at this very point was ready to go to heaven and be in the presence of the Lord. Things had gotten so bad. He'd been on the run so long. You know, our circumstances are not the same as David, but the lesson that we're taught here is whatever our circumstances are, they can lead us down the same path, bring us to the same condition that David was in. He goes on and he says, My tears have been my meat day and night. A greater indication that he was certainly in a state of spiritual depression. You know, when I went through my difficulties, I lost my appetite. And my tears were my appetite. They were my meat. I had to force myself to eat. We, we've been there. I, I know many of you have been there. When you get spiritually depressed, one of the first things to go is your appetite. you got no desire to eat. you got no peace and rest in your soul. Another sad thing in verse 4. He began to remember things. Have you ever, have you ever got back and, and began to think on things in the past? The good old days. When I read this verse, I thought so much about what Brother George used to say. If we live long enough, we may go to a place, a nursing home like many have went to. And our greatest desire is to come one more time to the house of the Lord. What David was saying. You see, if we, we want the book of Psalms to have an impression on our lives, if we, if we really want to get well, if, if we want to be made whole, then, then we have to meditate upon these words. We have to put ourselves in David's place and David's in our place because he was a real man of like passions, troubles, concerns, and difficulties just like you and I was. This is not some fairy tale that once happened. This is God's revealed truth through the experience of this man's life. When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me. For I had gone with the multitude. I would went with them to the house of God. He is in such a dire strait here that all he can think about is this man who he thought so much of, this king who wanted to kill him and tried for 10 years chasing him down through the valleys and up through the mountains and into the forest to kill David. And David had even gotten to the point here, I believe, when you study this out, that he thought God had forsaken him, had left him. Notice what he says in verse 3. Where is thy God? You know, this is a man who stood against Goliath as a little boy and said, I come unto thee in the name of the only true and living God, the armies of the living God. And with one sling of the stone, he put Goliath down. You know, he was a man after God's own heart. Can you imagine a man like that? One so faithful, one who had such a desire to serve God, get in such a condition as this. My point is we can all get there when our focus is wrong. Wilt thou be made whole? Do you want to get well? The first thing David gets here, it, he begins to realize what brought him to this state. I pour out my soul in me, for I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God. I don't know how long it had been since he'd been able to go to the house of God. With the voice of joy and praise. This was when he had joy in his soul, rest in his soul, peace in his soul. But he had unhappiness in his soul and trouble in his soul. Have you ever been there? I know we all have. And what I hate to see is, is to let this soul trouble resonate into our heart and soul. And our troubles get on top of us. When we're no longer on top of our troubles and they get on top of us, it will lead us to this state. Sometimes people, unfortunately, live a big part of their life in this condition. I know some of them that have. He goes on, he says, with the multitude that kept the holy day. It had been a long time since David had been able to go up and, and, and praise God and to rejoice with his brothers and sisters in the multitude at the house of God on a holy day. Something that you and I take for granted. But David here was remembering things. Oftentimes when we fall into these states of depression, 
the world begins to collapse on us. The pressures get so uh, tremendous that we just want to come to the end of our way, just like Elijah did. Why am I living? What is my life worth? But I'm telling you, there's folks like the man at the pool of Bethesda that have been in that condition so long. They don't want to get well. They don't want to be made whole. But David wasn't in that condition. He remembered what it was like to have joy and peace and praise in his heart. He faced the problems that he had of being chased like a fugitive, running across the country with a man trying to kill him. He remembered how joyous it was to be in the congregation of the saints and to go and worship his God. He remembered those things. And in verse 5, he says, Why aren't thou cast down? He begins to ask himself that question. We should too if we're cast down. If we're sinking down and we're no longer happy in our hearts and our soul. Why art thou cast down? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God. This is where it all starts. David didn't say hope in your fellow brother. Hope in your fellow sister. Hope in your neighborhood. Hope in your ball game. Hope in something that you hold on into this world. Hope in your job. Whatever it might be. We all hope in different things. He said hope in God. It's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. I am the door. I am come for one purpose. That you might have an abundant, happy life. He said troubles are coming your way. But he said be of good cheer. He said I'm bigger than any trouble that will ever come your way. David began to see this in his life. And he began to say unto himself, hope in God, hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. He was looking unto God's face and unto God's countenance for his help. So many in this country are looking for their help in everywhere but the Lord Jesus Christ, even God's people. And I truly believe that's why happiness has forsaken so many of the Lord's people. I'm not saying you don't ever smile or that you're not ever happy or you don't give that impression. But do you have lasting peace in your heart and soul? Are you truly happy? When you go around the world today and you see people, what the heart feels their faces are revealing. What do you see? What do you see among the Lord's people? Do you see a people that you want to be like? I'm excited for the Lord, zealous for the Lord, and happy. Happiness does something for you that nothing else will. It does. It gives you an energy that you can't get any other way. It makes you excited about life and excited about things. We can exist and live and not have any life dwelling in us. And I believe that's where David got here. He got in that very condition. For I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. For the help of God. He said, I will look unto his face. I will look unto him. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's Jesus Christ. I am the door. I am that I am. I am your joy. I am your peace. And there's one out there that's going to do everything he can in this life to steal your peace and to steal your joy. And if he accomplishes those two purposes, you will live a life more likely in misery and agony, never satisfied. No, the other people over here that's happy, they're having troubles too. They just take a different approach. They have a different focus in their life. Jesus already told them you're going to have these troubles. You're going to have all kinds of troubles. Man that is born of a woman is of a few days and full of troubles. We notice in verse 6, he says, Oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan and from the Hermonites and from the hill of Mizar. Probably mispronounced them. Wherever I go, he says, I, I, I'm going to remember you, Lord. I'm going to hope in you, Lord. You know, that's the only hope you and I have in this life, to be honest. We can hope in one another. We can hope in our family. But the true hope that you and I have is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in him alone. 
You know, we talked about that soul of David's that had no peace. Verse 7, deep calleth unto deep at the noise of the water spouts. All the waves and thy billows are gone over. He was certainly cast down and sinking low. He was in a state that he said, in and of myself I cannot recover. When you find someone that tells you they're happy, but yet the countenance of their face continues to shows you different. They actually believe in and of themselves they can recover. David said it can't be done. He said, you're like a sheep with all four feet in the air. If the shepherd doesn't help you, it's going to get bad. David looked unto the Lord as his help. When the waterfalls were falling and the, rock, the billows and the waves and the troubles come because they're coming. We've all had plenty now. We've had them in the past. We have them today. And unfortunately, according to the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to have them going forward until we die and go home to be with the Lord in heaven. But I tell you, we can be happy in the midst of the greatest trials that ever come if our focus is right. We're going to close with verse 11. It's a little different, but it tells a big story. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Why do I no longer have any peace? What's wrong with me? See, the psalmists speak to themselves and unto, unto their own souls and even unto God. These was, this was an experience that David was having that very much might be like an experience that you and I have had or someone that you know or that you will have. The burdens of life get heavy and they weigh us down. He goes on, he says, For I shall yet praise him who is the help of my countenance and my God. You see the difference there? In verse 5, he sought the help of God's countenance. He sought the Lord's help. He said, I, I'll hope in God every day, every time a problem arises. You know that if you don't talk to yourself, yourself will talk to you. And you may think I'm crazy the way I said that. You get up in the morning and you start letting self talk to you and it'll, it'll bring in the things of the past days. And it can lead you astray. David began to talk to his self. He began to ask his self questions. He began to face what brought him into this depressed condition. And now he tells us how we begin to be delivered from that condition. It begins by hoping in God. Because, friends, I'm here to tell you, there, that's the only hope we got. You can hope in everything in this world, but it'll pass away. But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He is the I, I am that I am. He's from everlasting to everlasting. Great is his faithfulness. He tells us that. Understand, you're going to have problems in this life. For I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. The troubles are coming. We're going to have some unhappy times. But I tell you, our hope is in God, even in the midst of the most difficult situations that you and I may ever face. And friends, we can be happy because there's coming a day, as we sang that song, and that day isn't very far out there. That day is real close, actually, for all of us. Regardless of how old we are, that day's coming, and it won't be long. And if we're going to get through this life and live it, with some vitality and some energy and some real happiness, Jesus Christ has to be the help of your countenance. Many of God's people have a fallen countenance, I believe. Unhealthy, unhappy is unhealthy. And we all struggle with that some. But I want you to be the healthiest and happiest people that ever lived and walked. And that ain't no joke. And I believe it's possible when we study and read God's word. We need to meditate upon these truths and put ourselves in that. These are not just stories that are good to listen to. These are God's revealed truth through human experience, through the emotions, the desires, and the suffering of the people of God. By the circumstances through which they were passing through, they will be our help. 
no matter what our circumstances are when we pass through. When David said, although I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why did he not fear any evil? For thou art with me. When you know the Lord's with you, there's no difficulty too great. There's no trouble that will take away the peace and joy you have in your soul. But I tell you, Satan has a desire to steal it, to kill it. And if he could, he'd literally destroy your life. He can't do that. But an abundant life and a joyful life and a peaceful life is in the Lord Jesus Christ. May Jesus Christ be the health of each and every one of our countenance as we go through life's journey. I thank you for your attention this morning. It is my desire to continue to study on this subject and to preach more on it because there's a lot more to be said about it. We need to be a happy people. Happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Do you have a number, Brother Randall? We're going to begin with number 168. Uh, we'll give the right hand of fellowship after we sing the first verse. If there be one here that has a desire to come and be a part of this church, you let the church uh, know your wishes. Number 168.